Let's give it up for the song leaders over there. Uh, you know, uh, I made a bet with Matthew Friday night. Uh, when Andre went up to preach at Friday Night Devo, I told him, I bet you Jason's going to make a joke that he taught Andre how to sing. And uh, <laughs> Matthew owes me 50 push-ups, hey man. <laughs> well, let's get up for Andre Stone all the song lyrics one more time. Let's jump right into it, shall I? Let's go to Luke chapter 3. Just a quick announcement for the Southland. We will have no leaders meeting after service. Uh, I still love everybody. But in Luke chapter 3, what happens in Luke chapter 1 and chapter 2, we understand there's a narrative of the infancy stage of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And it leaves us with the character known as John the Baptist alone in the wilderness to be trained by a group of radical Jews called the Essenes. And let's see what happens in Luke chapter 3 and verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Eteria, and Trachonitis and Licinius Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priest of Antiochus and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. Stop right there. So we understand that Luke was a very impressive man. He was an historian and a doctor. And we understand that many times in the book of Luke, he'll have and talk about different authority figures and religious figures so we can have some type of understanding the date of what we're reading. And from my study, I understand to be this year of 26 AD. And we understand the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi. It was written around 450 BC. So that's about a 500 year difference. And finally, in those 500 years, God did not speak to any man. But finally, the word of God came to John. Now, in the Old Testament, there's many different ways the word of God came to people. Burning bush, through a whisper. Now we have to have a conviction. How does God speak to us in the 21st century? Well, Hebrews 1 says, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through prophets in many times in various ways. But in the last days, he's spoken to us by his son whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him also he made the universe. So here it says that in the past, God spoke through men and women in very different ways. But in the last days, we understand from our kingdom study, that is the Christian era, which is the era that we're in right now, God speaks through his son. But right now, I can't knock on the door of Jesus Christ and go see him physically. So where's Jesus? Well, John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh. So right now, if you have a physical Bible or you have a Bible on your phone, this right here is Jesus Christ, and this is how God is going to speak to us this morning. And it said he came to John the Baptist in the wilderness, depicting some sort of a famine. Amos 8 verse 11 says, the days are coming, declares the sovereign Lord, that there will be a famine, a famine of hearing the words of God. I believe right now there's a famine in the 21st century. Many people, yes, they may be going to church, but they're not really hearing the words of God. Instead, they're hearing the words of a man. But we believe that we need to preach the word of God as it is in the Bible. We believe that the true message of God must be unleashed. We believe that if you're here this morning, that we believe that the word of God is the standard and we must break the silence in the 21st century. And that's the title of my lesson here this morning, Break the Silence. Now when you get in the word of God, it's time to get excited to get into the word of God. I believe that God has something for us today, and this could change our lives if you allow it. You know, it's been an amazing service so far. 
Uh, Jacob and Jen did a great job with the welcome. Let's give it up for them. It's hard for them. Uh, what an amazing communion by the Bueys. Uh, thank you guys so much for sharing your hearts. Uh, we're so grateful that Pat and Pam are here in Los Angeles. Amen. And uh, contribution, man. Christoph is a preacher. And uh, so, so grateful for your convictions. And I hope we all gave our contribution and special missions this morning. Amen. Let's go back to Luke 3. We're just going to camp in Luke 3 today. The Holy Woods. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Come on, Arthur. Verse 3, the Bible says, Luke 3, chapter, Luke 3, verse 3. He went to all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the prophet of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. Point number one, all mankind will see God's salvation. It says there's a voice calling out of the wilderness. That voice is John the Baptist. And he said that he was chosen by God to make straight paths for the Lord. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain made low. So be clear. Where is salvation? And all mankind restream to it. Now we understand that the book of Luke is traditionally known as the gospel addressed to the Gentiles and the Jews. Yeah. It was for all mankind. As Matthew was a gospel written to primarily the Jews. Yeah. And what we can learn from this as we continue reading is that Luke had a message for all mankind. Yeah. Let's continue reading. In verse 7. It says, John said to the crowds, coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit be cut down and thrown into the fire. This guy, John the Baptist, was a gnarly guy. The Bible says that he had camel's hair a leather belt, and his breakfast of choice was locusts. But it can't, you know, you got you to get, you get a little sweet there, you know what I mean? So he had locusts and honey. Can you imagine being at the mall or being at your campus or being uh, in, in, you know, somewhere else and you see this guy with locusts in one hand, honey in the other hand, a camel's hair, and a leather belt, and calling you to repent. <laughs> But people were hungry because there's been silence for 500 years and people were traveling all around to hear this maniac preach the word of God. Now, it's interesting, though, because Luke is more detailed in his gospel, but he omits a detail over here that Matthew 3 had. You have to turn there, but Matthew 3 in the account of John the Baptist, it's clear that John the Baptist told the Pharisees who were religious leaders at the time, that they're a brood of vipers. Luke chooses to omit that. He said everyone who was coming to him was a brood of vipers. Well, what do we learn from this? If all mankind needs to see God's salvation, it means all mankind is lost. Not just the Pharisees, but the pagans as well. And he says, who's born you? Who has warned you to flee from that truth? That everybody, man and woman, Gentile or Jew, black or white, every single person needs to hear the truth of God's salvation. And he says there's some people that would introduce venomous teachings that would stray away from that truth. You know, I don't know, have you guys ever seen a snake before? Yeah. Have you gotten in close proximity to a snake before? 
man, I don't know what happened to me one day. As a little kid, I went to this Animal Kingdom party. This, this girl had a lot of money. I don't know. It's just good for her. But I, I went to this party, and they had some yellow pythons there. And one by one, they encouraged all the kids, let's take a picture with the python. And I was freaking out. <laughs> like, why do we do this? But, you know, good old-fashioned peer pressure, you know. I, I took a picture with that python, and I was afraid, but amen, we got a nice picture that I don't have anymore. But, <laughs> but I, I remember one day, you know, I, I grew up from, I'm from Los Angeles. But I'm from Woodland Hills. I'm, I'm a Valley boy. Um, so some LA people don't claim me, but amen, you know. I claim LA County. You know, I, I grew up with my, my uncle, my, my aunties, my cousins. We had a pretty big household. One day, my brother and I were playing basketball outside, and my brother used to destroy me at basketball. I'd get so angry. And my auntie was there, you know, doing some gardening things. And then she sees what we then learn is a black linen bag but she swore by it, she saw a snake. And my aunt freaked out. And my, I'm Nigerian too, so Nigerians are incredibly dramatic people. I don't know my guy CJ understands what I'm talking about over here. Incredibly dramatic, and she's running, screaming, bloody mutter, there's a snake! And my brother and I were like, oh my, I was like, man, we gotta move out. Um, we, got, we, we, gotta, we gotta burn the house. Burn it down. I'm, I'm, I was so afraid. And then we, 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 we called the police. <laughs> I'm like, and they're like, why are you calling us? You gotta call animal, whatever. So, so then, then, then my, 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 my mom was like, wait a minute, let me, let me go check that. I appreciate the brave my mom. She's like, let me go check this out. So hours pass, like four or five hours pass. My mom goes outside and she asks my aunt, like, where do you see the snake? And it's my aunt, you know, very scarily says right there. And she looks like, that's just a, it's a black linen bag. But you know what's crazy? My aunt ran so fast away from that snake. That little, there was a bike next to where she was running. She trips over the bike, falls on her two front teeth. And she chips her two front teeth. I felt so bad for her. But you know, I, I was thinking about that in this passage. She was so afraid of the snake. Why is that? Because it could kill you. But sadly, we live in a time where people run after these poisonous false teachings as opposed to running to see God's salvation. What are these false teachings? The, the idea of atheism, that there's, just, there's no God. Come on, Romans 1 says, look at the world around you. You think we came from here from nothing? Of course there must be a God. The false teach of hedonism, that just go after pleasure and pleasure, bring as much pleasure as you can, and that's gonna fulfill you. How many times we see celebrities kill themselves, they had all the pleasure they could possibly have, that's not gonna fulfill you. What about the false teaching of the faith alone doctrine? Many people right now are gonna come to a service this morning, hear a man like come up over here in this pulpit and say, if you wanna accept Jesus, the personal Lord and Savior, come up here and say his prayer. Most of those people are going to go back and not change anything at all. This is a false doctrine. It's poisonous. And it's killing the world. And God is saying, stop running to the snakes. They're poisoned. Come and see. Come to God's kingdom and see God's salvation. The, the truth is God wants everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to come to the knowledge of the truth and be saved. I, I mean, you guys, you guys came to church today, right? Uh, I mean, I think you guys want to be with God one day, right? I mean, I, I'm here. I mean, amen, I love my wife. You know, she, she did, I think my favorite part of the, the church service was the announcements. Now, you know, J well, well, I don't know if it was Jason's part so much. My wife did a great job with the announcements. But hey, there's no, there's no marriage in heaven, right? Uh, we're, my, my wife and I will be best friends forever, but I'm here because I love God. <laughs> so you guys want to see God one day in heaven? Well, there's an interesting passage in Exodus 33. You have to turn there. I'm going to take a sip of water, though. My mouth's going to dry. 
In Exodus 33, in verse 20, you have to turn there, but I'm going to read it. God says, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. Okay, so we want to see God's face one day in heaven. But the Bible clearly teaches that no one can see God and live. Well, we understand the Old Testament is a physical foreshadowing of spiritual realities. So what does this mean? I believe this means for us to see God. We can't see God and what he's doing in our life unless we die to ourselves. You can't see God if you want to live. You must die, as John 3 says, if you want to see the kingdom. What do you have to do? Be born again. You cannot see God if you love your life too much. You cannot see God and see what God is doing if you don't die to yourself. You cannot see God's salvation unless you say, I want to be born again. Amen. You see, I don't think the issue with this world is that too many people are perishing. I think the issue is that too many disciples are trying to live. If we stop wanting to die, my brothers and sisters, I'm telling you right now, you will not see God. If you don't choose, as John 12 says, Father, glory for my name, let me be the sea that falls down and dies so more can be live. We won't see him in heaven. But I believe I'm looking at a group of people who would choose to die and be uncomfortable. Be uncomfortable at campus, be uncomfortable in their workplaces, and share their faith with that person when it's a little awkward. I look at a group of people who choose to die and bend their schedules, stay up late, get up early, so they can study the Bible with people and see them get baptized. I look at a group of people that would choose to sacrifice financially so that all mankind from Africa to Europe to the United States of America can see God's salvation by giving our special missions, amen? I, I want to challenge you this morning. That's okay, we come to church to get challenged, right? I don't think we just came just to get a good power thought. We, we didn't think that, that's not like, we're not that kind of church. We don't want to just give you a power thought. We want to help you get closer to God. What are you afraid of? Write it down right now. Or think about it. Write it down, think about it. What are you afraid of? And then write down, God is bigger. God is bigger. We must choose our pain. Die to ourselves now so that we can see God and so others can see him as well. Or choose to live. Love our lives too much and watch ourselves die spiritually. And all those we love die spiritually as well. I think sometimes instead of seeing salvation, we can see trepidation. I know the USC students are like, what does that mean? <laughs> I, I saw a train, so he's trying to look at these Chris, I'm like, what does that mean? I, I, know, I know Caleb went to Berkeley. I know, I know that they have, they have a great grammar there. I didn't know what it means either, but let, 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 me, give you the, let me give you the definition. <laughs> trepidation, or trepidation, a nervous or fearful feeling of the unknown. Instead of seeing salvation, we could get so freaked out. I appreciate what the boy said. The cross means peace. We could be so freaked out. Instead of seeing what God wants to do, we just get paralyzed. Paralyzed in fear. I want to tell you this morning, guys. God is bigger than your fear. God is bigger than your finances. God is bigger than all of those things. Trust God Get rid of trepidation, and let's see God's salvation. Are you guys with me? You know, every, every time I preach, I try to reminisce on the time that I became a disciple and, get, and I got baptized because it really, it's very humbling for me. Uh, July 31st, 2016, I got baptized into Christ. Amen. 
Uh, I was the only campus student in the middle of nowhere of the middle of nowhere, a truly a wilderness called Merced, California. Yeah. In the Central Valley. Yeah. And when they told me, hey, you gotta be a disciple now. It's time to go share faith. I was a little bit afraid. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I actually had a terrible stuttering problem as a child. I, it was so bad that my kindergarten teacher thought I was mentally challenged because I couldn't speak. But, you know, how I got over it, I, you know, it's kind of an embarrassing story, but I was a big nerd, played a lot of Call of Duty. And uh, I, got, I actually got paid to play Call of Duty. So I made YouTube commentaries. So I wouldn't post a commentary until I didn't stutter. And that's how I got over stuttering. But what happened was it infused a great introversion in me. I was very introverted by nature. Very, by nature, I'm very timid. But when you get the Holy Spirit, you get a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. So I was like, okay. I was like, man, I'm, I'm one voice here, Merced. I, I, for my knowledge, there's no other disciples there. So I knew it was time to go share my faith. The first day I got there, I invited someone to come to a Bible study. She invited nine other people. Wow. And they all came. Wow. So I'm like, hey, we're going to have, and I was about two weeks old spiritually. Wow. I was like, I guess it's time to do a Bible talk. <laughs> then two weeks later, 16 people came. Wow. And many people got a chance to hear the word of God. But I mean, what was God trying to show me? That he could use me. God can use me. He can use me to help people see God's salvation. I want to encourage you today. God can use you. You can be used by God. You can be used to help people see God's salvation. And more can say, Jesus is Lord in Los Angeles. We can't limit God. It's time to pray, pray dangerous prayers. Dangerous prayers for God to use you. Hey, think about it, man. The Bible says in Matthew 11, verse 11, true, I tell you, among those born of women, there's not been risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. John the, he says the person who gets baptized, Rochelle's going to get baptized today. She's greater than John the Baptist. If we really believe that, that every single one of us is a voice in the wilderness, that we can break the silence wherever we go, I believe all mankind will see God's, God's salvation over there in the West region. I believe God, all mankind will see God's salvation over there in the Southland. I believe all mankind will see salvation over there at USC. Over there, UCLA, and all around the Metro Coast, all mankind will see God's salvation. Let's continue going in Luke 3. Let's, let's just lead verse, verse 10. It says, what shall we do then? So John the Baptist calls into repentance, and they're like, why, what do I gotta do? John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. Anyone who has food should be, do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Jesus asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to do, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Well, I think it's quite interesting in this passage that what we see is everything that had to deal with repentance here either dealt with possessions or money. After all, right now we are in mission season. And the Bible says, here's the thing, you, you cannot serve God and serve money. You will love one and hate the other and vice versa. I think a free point here, let's not let money be the reason we don't evangelize the world. Let's not let our love for money or our fear of where we're gonna be financially get in the way of evangelizing the world. I don't think it's by chance that John the Baptist called them to this repentance because the Bible does say where your treasure is, so is where your heart. 
That one's for free, but let's continue going. In, in verse, verse 15. Amen. I know the boys love free. Every, everyone, everyone's paying for free right now. I like increase my faith. Very, very righteous man. Luke 3, verse 15. So the people were waiting expectantly, and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, which sandals of those I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His wooden fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John extor- exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Our second point, all mankind will be divided. John the Baptist says, I'm not the Messiah. Someone greater than me is going to come. I baptize you with water, but this man will baptize you with the spirit and fire. Now I think there's a lot of different schools of thought what this means, but I think we have to let the Bible interpret the Bible. The baptism that John the Baptist is talking about, the baptism of the spirit and fire, is not two separate baptisms. Isaiah 6 talks about how when God's going to come with judgment, he's going to use the spirit and fire. And the book of Luke, or John, he then says the illustration of this, of how God's going to do it. There's a farmer with a winnowing fork. He has a threshing floor. He will take the winnowing fork, put it in the threshing floor, and throw it up in the air. And then because of gravity, the wheat has weight to it. It's going to fall down to the ground, and they'll collect it. The chaff who has no weight to it will be blown away and then burned up. What John the Baptist is saying, God's going to come with his winning fork. He's going to come to the threshing floor, which is the world. Put his fork in there, throw it up in the air. Those who obey God are wheat, and they'll be put into the barn. Those who don't obey God are chaff, and a fire is going to come and judge them. Different from how it was in the days of Noah, God used water to judge. This time he's going to use fire. Well, how do we know? I mean, if I'm in you, I want to be the wheat, right? I don't want to be the chaff. How do we know if we're the wheat or we're the chaff? Well, the Bible says very simply, 1 Timothy 4, verse 16, they have to watch your life and your doctrine closely, persevering, because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. There must be a distinction between life and doctrine. Well, let's see, when was the first harvest of this wheat that ever came in the Bible? Let's go to Acts 2. All mankind will be divided. Acts 2, the concept of this passage, the orator is Peter. The author is our historian, Dr. Luke. It's the day of Pentecost, and many are there hearing the words of God. Millions of people are there. And they want to know. They ask the same question that the people asked John the Baptist. What shall I do? Well, let's see what Peter says. Verse 36. Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, What shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many of the words, he he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourself from this corrupt generation. Those who accept his message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So over here, we we see unsaved men asking a saved man, what do I got to do to get my life right with God? Peter did not say, hey, come and say this prayer. 
Come and accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. He didn't say, come bring the babies and baptize them, and then we'll confirm them later. He said, because of your faith, you must choose to repent. That word repent is metanoia in the Greek. It means to change your mind, to be reborn, to say, I'm going to accept the will of God and throw off anything that may hinder me. And then when they made a decision to repent, then and only then, they were baptized into Christ. 3,000 people that day were then baptized. The Bible clearly teaches for someone to be saved, they must have faith, repent, and then be baptized. You know, I grew up in church, but I never heard that before. What was taught to me that all you got to do is believe, but the Bible says faith without deeds is dead. I want to challenge you this morning, if you are a guest, you got to get into the word of God. What do you got to repent of this morning? You know God is hitting your heart right now. And you can feel that, man, I've got to change something in my life. Someone invited you to get into the word of God. Make a decision to repent of your sins. And these guys, it took them one day to repent and get baptized. You will be shocked how quickly you can change when you get into the word of God. Now for us who are disciples, who've been baptized... Well, John 8, 31 says, if you hold to my teachings, then you're really my disciples. And then you know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Just because you are a member of the ICC doesn't mean you're saved. You can be in the church and be lost. Jeremiah 7 says that the people said, I'm in the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, I'm in church, I'm in church. But he said, if you really change your ways, then you are really my disciple. I want to challenge you this morning. If there's anything in your heart that's calloused, there's anything that you've been holding on to that many people have been calling you to change, make a decision today. Is it really worth it? Is it really worth it to be divided? To be chaff? And then be burned up? Or maybe, I don't know everyone in this crowd, Maybe you've been a disciple and you've fallen away. Don't waste time. Get your life right with God. The awesome thing about repentance is just a decision. And these guys did it that day and made a decision to repent and follow God and be saved. Let's make a decision this morning. Amen. You know, it's it's been so awesome uh, being in the Southland. I love the Southland region, and it's been awesome being over there at USC. Uh, I'm right in the, the, the heart of the campus. Uh, I live right behind Frat Row. Uh, pray for me, sometimes I can't sleep because these kids are always partying. But we're going to baptize some frat guys, amen? You know, if we had an awesome campus, Diva this Friday night, did we not? Uh, Jason at his best. Preached an incredible lesson, the spiritual world war, one of my favorites. But I also love the the good news sharing portion of that uh, Friday Night Devo. And it was awesome to to see Trey share some good news about his sister, amen. Uh, You know, Trey's a freshman at USC, and uh, he's really going after being a light over there. He just got baptized a couple weeks ago. And actually, this, today, someone was supposed to get baptized who was a USC sophomore. But sadly, he let persecution get in his life, and he himself became a persecutor. Not by chance, but by God, one of his best friends is in the same dorm as Trey. And that man went to Trey and said, you're you're in that church? And Trey's like, yeah, I'm in that church. He's like, dude, don't don't you know what they say about it? And Trey was like, yeah, I know what they say about it. And Trey was like, bro, you have to understand, all we're doing all we're doing is calling people to the Bible. The Bible is going to divide. I, I love when persecution happens. I think, I, think, I think some of us get a little weirded out by it. 
I see this God's natural divider. Who's really in it? Who wants to be in the fire in this world to save them from the fire of hell? And God uses it to see who's really about it. And I was so proud of Trey. As a young Christian, stand up for his conviction. You know, some will say, well, you know, this is a controversial Christian movement. We know that we believe we're following the book of Acts. How do you know if it's not going to fail? Well, I'll say to them, Acts 5, 30 to 39, you have to turn there. Come on, come on, I remember being a young minister at SJSU, San Jose State University, and a man from the former movement, I, I, you know, I was not even born when it started, but um, was telling me that, hey, like, you're, you're good, you're good. This thing is going to fail again. He was persecuting me. And then I told him, Acts 5, 30 to 39, where it says, therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go. For if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop them. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. And I told him, just look at the fruit. Look at the fruit. Look at the people changing their lives radically. With over now 10,000 disciples and over 100 churches in 57 nations. It's undeniable that this is not a movement of man, but this is God's modern day movement. Are you guys with me? You know, I, I had to say that one for Kip. You know, Kip's not here, so I had to say his tagline. But I, I really want to challenge us here this, this morning. We, we, we need to know the Bible. Uh, if, we, if we want to stay disciples, we got to know the Bible more than anyone around us. I want to challenge you this year to get into the Bible the most you've ever had. Maybe you've been a disciple for 30 plus years. I know the Bible says a lot to offer you. I know Walter say amen to that. Maybe you just got baptized. And it's time to really get into the word of God. Because we know that's how we're going to stay faithful to the end. Let's close out Luke 3, verse 21. You know, I appreciate Matt and Selma. They know I, I sweat a lot, so they, they bought me a handkerchief for my, 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 my birthday. Very practical gift. <laughs> so, it's awesome. Luke 3. I feel very loved right now. Thank you. Let's go back to Luke chapter 3. We're going to close out here. Verse, verse 21. So then, the shift of focus turns from John the Baptist to now Jesus Christ. And in verse 21, it says, while people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And he was praying, heaven was open, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son. Whom I love, with you I am well pleased. How can you imagine being there? Wow. Seeing Jesus get baptized. And to hear the voice from heaven, God's voice, saying that I am pleased with him. My final point for you, all mankind has a destiny. You know, Jesus was baptized to fulfill our righteousness. Then after his baptism... There's a genealogy that was given in the book of Luke. And I was reading this genealogy, it, occurred, it occurred, occurred to me, everyone has their own genealogy. What is so awesome that even before we were born, God destined us to become disciples. Yeah. Jesus' destiny can be found in Romans 3.25. You have to turn there. It says, through our union with Christ, we too have claimed by God as his own inheritance. Before we were born, he gave us our destiny. That we will fulfill the plan of God. He will always accomplish every purpose and plan in his heart. Jesus' destiny says, or in this verse, it says that he was given to sacrifice, take away our sins, and now he's our mercy seat because of his death on the cross. See, Jesus was born to die. 
so that we could be saved. The plan of God is for all mankind to become a disciple, get baptized, and be taught to obey everything. That is the fact of why we're here today. Now, the details how it's going to look like in your life, I don't exactly know. But I do know that's exactly why you're here this morning. But sometimes, sadly, the Bible says in Proverbs 14, verse 12, there's a way that seems right to a man, but at the end it leads to death. So we can see God's perfect plan, but sometimes the tear from it because we want our own way. And if you're a baptized disciple, the call is to offer yourself as a living sacrifice so that others can live. You gotta find your destiny. I think right now we need more people to say, I want to step up and lead. Come on, One more people to say, hey, I want to lead that Bible talk. I want to disciple that person. I want to lead a ministry. I want to help build God's church. And it's clear if you are not a baptized disciple, it's time to change that. Because that's that is indeed your destiny. And you know, today is awesome. A UCLA freshman studying neuroscience. Rochelle is going to be baptized into Christ, I bet. You know, I heard she, wanted to be, she wants to be a neurosurgeon. And that's, that's pretty awesome. But today she finds her real destiny and starts her journey of being a sold out disciple of Jesus Christ. And I believe that is God's testing for every single person. But now, what are you waiting for? Come on, come on, bro. Acts 22, verse 16, a man was waiting three days to be baptized. His name was Saul. And God says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Washing your sins away. Some of us have been studying the Bible for a little while. It's time to make a decision. To be totally committed. Give up everything. And follow God. Because we know at the waters of baptism, we heard the very voice of God. When the two most important questions were asked to you, do you believe that Jesus Christ died, buried, resurrected on the third day, and now sits at the right hand of God? And we said, yes. And then they asked, what is your good confession? And we said, Jesus is Lord. And then we got into those waters. And spiritually speaking, just like Jesus Christ, he said, that's my son. That's my daughter. And silence was broken in our lives. So now, let's go out of these doors and break the silence all around the Metro Coast. And to God be the glory. <laughs>